happy December. Like, can you Woo! believe it's 20? It's December 1st. 21, December 1st. Wow. It's crazy out here, y'all. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, but yes, good evening, good afternoon, good night, good morning. Whatever time you are watching this, shout out to you and thank you so much for joining us on our live. This is Trey and Jay, and I'm Trey. And I'm Jay. Hey. And as you already know, we always make sure to tell you on this channel, we share our lives to empower others to love Jesus, love themselves, and love others well. And this topic, first of all, I probably say this mm. every week because I'm like, y'all, it'd be good. It'd be good stuff. It'd be good stuff. Um, and I'm not just saying that because... I'm in it, but I'm like legitimately saying that it's good stuff. So um, this week we have a whole entire conversation for y'all. And I don't want to talk any further because I really want to make sure that our guest has all of the time to talk. Um, and for you all to have all the time to get into the comments uh, and ask your questions and all the things. And as you already know, I'm going to flip it to, to Janelle um, and she is going to let us know what we are talking about on tonight. I think Trey is excited about this topic because we always choose topics very inten uh, intentionally and you know these are topics that people um, can utilize. We, you know, we're talking about real things and so today we're talking about um, depression and loneliness in this holiday season. So the month, as we know, it's the holiday time it's the holiday season and we are focusing on different aspects of the holiday this month. Today, we're fo focusing on um, depression and loneliness. I know that sounds so heavy, but we got to address it. I mean, you know, a lot of us are going through um, that. We're, go we're, be we're depressed and we're masking it. A lot of us are lonely in a room full of people. You know, you have friends everywhere. You're in conversations everywhere, but you're still feeling very lonely. And so we asked our friend, who was a therapist and a lover of Jesus? I mean, you know, like, what more can you ask for, right? Those are the two things that are so important for this conversation. And we asked our friend Trishna to come on with us and talk because she knows what to say. <laughs> she knows. She does this for a living. So we are so excited to have you, Trishna. Hello. Welcome. So can you can you just say the um, what we're talking about one more time, please? I'm so recording. we're... We're talking about uh, loneliness and depression, but specifically seasonal loneliness and depression, because a lot of the times uh, we are people suffer from uh, depression and loneliness, especially in this at this time of the year. And I would say I think it's even more. And Trishna, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's even more because a lot of us uh, we lost a lot of loved ones in the last two years. So this is the time that you're remembering, like head on that this person is not here, maybe mm -hmm. a birthday passed, but everybody pretty much celebrates, most people celebrate Thanksgiving, most people, <laughs> most people celebrate, excuse me, my daughter's here <laughs> in the background. <laughs> most people celebrate Christmas and the new year, and it's just the new year. And so we are excited to have Trishna on because she's a licensed therapist and she's a great person. <laughs> she, she loves to speak to people. She does this for a living. So Trishna, um, hi. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here, be present with you both. So thank you again. Oh, thank you for being with us. Um, because I know people pay you for this advice. So, you know, we are so grateful. <laughs> and we're well, tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, you're a wife, a mother, and you have your own practice. I remember when you actually I don't know when you started, but I know when I found out, and I was so excited. So I don't know if that was the beginning of it. And I'm just so proud of you to do your to do this work because this work is so important. Mm -hmm. So tell Thank us about you. that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So yeah, I started my practice, I would say, during COVID actually. Um, okay. full time. Prior to Oof. COVID, I was just doing um, independent contract work with um, a couple of companies like Talkspace, Seven Cups of Tea, where I would provide text-based therapy online. So because of COVID, I was doing um, play therapy with children who were on the spectrum, but I was losing mm -hmm. a lot of hours of work. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take that chance. Um, of course, fear did creep in a lot. 
Um, and I was just like, wait, God did not give us a spirit of fear. So I was going to just take the chance since I wasn't working <laughs> many hours anyway and just start my private practice. Um, and just as an FYI, I am a licensed master of social worker, so LMSW. And because I'm an LMSW and have a private practice, I have to um, be under the supervision of an LCSW. So that was how I was able to start my private practice. And it's so like LCSW, a licensed clinical social worker? Clinical social worker, right. Um, so I started that practice last year in August and now it's been a, uh, a year plus more and I cannot even say how thankful I am and I'm sitting in gratitude for how fast the, the practice has grown and because of the, the practice I've been able to also just start a small project which um, I probably briefly mentioned to you ladies the release pro the, the release program and basically the goal of the release program is to create safe spaces within schools, nonprofit organizations, small companies where students, young professionals like us can have the space to work through our emotions so that so that we can thrive and feel better holistically mm -hmm. in the work and school space. So that's one thing that that's I've good. been working on. Yeah, for the past mm -hmm. couple of months. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Thank you for doing that because I mean, obviously you know. The, the importance of this, but I think people are coming to understand the importance of mental and emotional health and how you can't only focus on your body. And some of us yes. don't even focus on our bodies, right? Uh, our The health of our bodies. Um, but you have to focus on your mental and emotional and spiritual health, you know, and that's, yes. we, that's what we have in common. I know that you are, you are very, I know that you love God because of how you serve. I don't even know you that well, but I I can tell that you love Jesus because you serve very well. I I just I just can tell. I, I she she ministry. serves with the kids ministry with the moms like ministry, faithful. right? You know, and I know it's hard. And I, she has two <laughs> yeah. kids in her own comp, her own business, but you know, you still find time to serve, and I think that's amazing. Even during the pandemic, I I see you, girl. I see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so I, I, I really want to get into the first, uh, you know, just kind of talking about what what is seasonal depression and why is it seasonal? Because I, right. I feel like we hear the word, the phrase seasonal depression and kind of dismiss it as, girl, you just oh, yeah, get over it. You sad <laughs> for a season. You sad for what, three months? You, you sad for two months? Like get over it so what exactly is seasonal depression and why is it seasonal like what does that even mean yeah so seasonal depression or the clinical term i believe it's seasonal affective disorder where there is less sunlight during certain times of the year where it then creates depression and it could be mild mm -hmm. moderate severe it depends on the individual um and I believe they've said that it has something to do with like the serotonin levels, which is like a mm -hmm. chemical in the brain um, where the serotonin levels decrease or are lessened. And because of that, depression occurs during these certain times of the year, which is typically fall into winter. Not saying that people don't experience it during spring, summer, but we're more likely alive, more energetic. We're happier when there's sun out, when it's hot. Outside. You know, when the, the, the sun goes down at 5 p.m., we have to be inside. It's cold. It definitely affects us a different way. So mm -hmm. it's usually around winter, fall, where we experience that seasonal depression. And it usually has something to do with the serotonin, ser serotonin levels in our brain, which affects our mood. Mm. I mean, you know what's so interesting? You say um, that there is a technical term for all of this because... I know for myself, I thought that this was something that I was the only person who experienced because I'm like, in December, everybody, like Thanksgiving, I don't know about y'all, but December, not November, December, it's like, oh my gosh, everybody and their mother is about to be like, I'm engaged. And everybody and their mother is going to be like, um, here's my baby bump. And it's like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, and, and honestly, 
you may want to feel like great and excited and all of the things for somebody, but you're just like in this place of dang, like it's, it, it's, I hate to use the phrase woe is me as if it's like mm-hmm. something simple, but it's, 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 it can truly, I remember that there was a year that I was like, yeah, no, I don't even want to, because I could feel it within me just kind of brewing because that's where I was in my own space. So I wonder how do you, how do you work with clients who um, kind of have like ebbs ebbs and flows around um, seasonal depression, or if there's a particular thing that is causing their seasonal depression, if there's like somebody that they were with, like now all of a sudden got a girlfriend or you know, somebody that you were with now all of a sudden got a boyfriend. It's like, what? Wait, how? How? <laughs> you know, right. just together, all of those things. Um, or even when people have been trying, when people have, you know, like all of the things, and you're just like, dang, I just don't want to see it anymore. Like, how do you, how do you how do you work with clients who are having ebbs and flows of their own seasonal depression? Right. So normally the number one thing I would say or ask them is how can you be more kind, gentle, and loving to yourself during this season? Mm -hmm. Because we have a seasonal depression where we see the, the, the light is not out. Um, it's the sun is going down earlier. It's colder and we feel a certain way. And then on top of that, you know, we have a depression where, as you mentioned, um, Tracy, where, people experience depression because they're no longer with, you know, their partner or, um, you know, during the holidays, that's when family typically get, typically get together and they may not want to be around family because sometimes there's yeah. drama, sometimes <laughs> yeah. dramas yeah. are being caused and they don't feel safe or mm-hmm. protected. So it's like dealing with all of those things can create depression as well. So, you know, between the seasonal depression and just depression around, uh, the depression around the pressures of being around other people and satisfying satisfying them or appeasing them. It's like, how can you be more kind, loving, and gentle to yourself, knowing that this is a hard time for you? So that's usually mm-hmm. like the number one question we try to work through together and see how that would look like on a day-to-day basis. How can you be kind? How can you be more loving? How can you be more gentle? to yourself when you know that possibly the inner critic, I always talk about the inner critic because that's usually that part of you, that part of us that's really loud, that's ready to say, you're doing this wrong. Why aren't you doing it this way? Why aren't you, you know, with family when maybe you just want to be by yourself? So it's like, how can you quiet down that inner critic? How can you be more loving to yourself? How can you be more gentle? What are some of the things that you can do on a day-to-day basis to experience that? Wow. What does that even look like? What does that mean? Right. So, and, and that can look different for everyone, right? For, for each, for every person. So maybe it's like thinking about what are the, some of the things that you like to do? What, what are your hobbies? What, mm-hmm. what brings, what cultivates okay. joy in your life, right? So for one person, it may be, I love to write, or I like to read books, or I like to just veg out and watch TV. Right. So maybe it's thinking about how do you incorporate those things on a daily basis so that you're not thinking about the things that you no longer have. Right. Or yeah. thinking yeah. about how, you know, you're stuck in the house and, you know, don't want to be outside in the cold. OK, we know that. So what can you do knowing <laughs> that this is a fact you don't want right. to be outdoors? How can you still cultivate joy? Because life is an ending. You still want to experience yeah. that. You still want to yeah. be yeah. happy. Right. So it's like you're acknowledging how you're feeling, but then how do you work through that once you acknowledge it? Mm. So it, it, it can look different for everyone. It, it's based on like what brings you joy, what brings happiness to you and seeing how you. I love I love that you made a point to mention specifically around acknowledging what you're feeling and then moving into now. What are some things that make you feel good? So some of the things, I remember my um, therapist said that to me one day around um, doing the opposite of what I intend to do or what I, what I initially want to do. Like, let's say, for example, if I'm just like, oh no, I, it's a bad day. I'm just like, (laughs) it's a no, I'm not doing. And then that's, you know, I remember her saying one day, um, 
Try taking a shower, you know? Try taking a midday shower, like uh, just a midday. You know, the 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 opportunities of, of working remote um, or even working hybrid, if you are working hybrid, is being able to still relatively be in the home and still getting access mm-hmm. to the shower. Um, and I, a few weeks ago, I actually had one of those days where I was just like, oh, every moment needed mm. a reset. Every moment of the day needed a reset. And I took like two showers that day. <laughs> um, like I took one at noon, then I took one maybe like three o'clock, and I was like, "All right, let's let's try let's try again," <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and and so it just being something that you're cognizant of, I think, is what I'm hearing you say. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no no, you know sometimes I was just gonna say um, real quickly. Sometimes we feel like we have to do all these different things to mm. to feel better but it can be as simple as as you mentioned like taking a nice shower like for me i like to take a bath in the dark <laughs> it was crazy but oh my gosh I thought sounds that great not that I do this sounds great thing. it makes me feel like i'm in a sauna like i'm in a i'm, yes. at, um, I'm at peace in a spa the, yes <laughs> right. yeah right <laughs> yes yes so yeah, something as you know, as small as taking a, a bath can make you just feel so more at ease, more calm, um, mm-hmm. just more in tuned with how your body and your mind is feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of the things I'm hearing as well is you have to know yourself. You know, at least knowing how much what you like and don't like. And if that's the if you don't know, we would implore you to go and find out. You know, for me, I didn't realize that I haven't watched cartoons in a long time because it's always on because of my daughter. But like for me, I used to watch cartoons in grad school because it was my way of just not thinking. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the case for most television shows, but like especially cartoons, you know. And I didn't know until I tr- somebody, my mentor at the time, said, you know, you can do something as simple as watch cartoons, eat your, you know, your favorite foods for that time, because you know my favorite food is not good for me, and <laughs> and enjoy yourself for that night, you know, like like I always tell Tracy, we say fold up your toes, and that what we mean. <laughs> What we mean that by that is just like crush your legs and like just relax, you know. Just not relax, like, yes. Like just relax, <laughs> and and I get that, you know, I get that. And so for me, that's how I like ease my way out of certain things. Of mm. course, in addition to prayer, studying the word, you know. But I do have a not but but and I do have a question because some people that's not enough for their depression. You know, yeah. there's some people who okay. You know, let's let's do let's be pay attention to myself and the triggers. That's pretty much what you're saying. And 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 pay attention to what I like and don't like and do some of those things and, and be kind to yourself, which I highly agree, you know, with. But there's just some people who are depressed and it doesn't matter what they do, it like it can't they can't mm-hmm. shake it off. Like what 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 are your what's your advice for that? So it's known to the, the symptoms, what you're experiencing and how severe it is to the point that you're be asking yourself, do I need to see someone at this point, right? Because there's different severities of depression. There's like mild depression, which is like low, we don't have that much energy. Um, and then there may be moderate to severe depression where we're feeling helpless, hopeless, maybe mm-hmm. even having mm-hmm. suicidal thoughts, right? So it's mm-hmm. depending on where you are the hopelessness then, yes yeah maybe mm-hmm. saying i need to speak to someone at this point i i can't get out of bed i'm not eating i feel helpless you know what's the point of living right those mm-hmm. are some signs that maybe for um and you know whether that be um, a medical practitioner or a therapist um, even just getting in contact maybe a meeting with a close friend just so that other people are aware of like, what's happening and what you're experiencing so that you're not alone in it. But I agree with you a lot, Janelle. Like there's different severities to the depression where there's some that are manageable, right? It's still a struggle. It's challenging, but manageable. And then there are people who struggle with depression where it's like too much for them. It's like they don't know what yeah. to do at that point. 
I guess eating up their lives. And I wonder if it's too much because of, and, and the reason why I utilize the word too much is because I think if it's overwhelming, I wonder if it's overwhelming because you might not have had that experience with this with this level of depression. Uh, maybe has there ever been a thing or something or some type of something triggered, um, like something that happened in your past or even being triggered by abandonment? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. consider all of the people who, you know, as we were talking about earlier, just like, considering all the people who have um, maybe met someone in the summertime or, and, and I'm, I'm specifically just talking about this point um, because I do know that this is sometimes the, the case, um, but met someone in the summertime, everything was great, great, great. Come winter time, it's, it's a dub. Um, that can be really alarming hey. to someone who has experienced any level of abandonment and triggered that type of um, depression to a level that they've never experienced before. Like, how does that even work? Because how would you know if medication is necessary? How would you even know if speaking to a therapist is necessary? How would you even know to go that far um, beyond your own self, your own brain right. to know hey, knock, knock, something is happening. This is mm. something that we need to, to consider. No, that is so true. And that's why I, I feel that resources, there needs to be more resources, educational um, information um, provided, especially to our young black women um, who may not even understand and know what they're experiencing and going through, right? Someone oh, my goodness. Like, oh, I Krishna. haven't eaten for a whole week. Maybe there's, you know, I just, just, I'm just not eating where it can be in relation to what they've been experiencing, whether it be at home, yeah. at school, or, yeah. you know, it's just a symptom of them not doing well or responding well to what they're experiencing. So more education, more resources, you know, like readily available to, to men and to women, of course, who need this information because a lot of people do not know. They do not know. There's something you you just you just hit the nail yeah. on the head of what I was going to ask next because um I, I was going to ask if there's any specificity around um gender when it comes to therapy, when it comes to seeking mm -hmm. out therapy. And the reason why I asked that question is because um culturally I feel like, you know, there's there has been a push, I would say over the last year and a half which has been super exciting to see and witness yes. um, that there's been a push for black therapists, for people mm -hmm. to get, you know, BIPOC therapists, black indigenous people of color, like really working in that space um, has been really exciting to see many people like retweeting black therapists, like, okay, you want another one? Here's another one. Here's another one. I'm just like, really talking about it. Um, I think the question that I have also comes from what you just said around women not necessarily knowing that they are depressed. You know, uh, black women feeling like I got to take it all on and not knowing because we've been been uh, socialized um, to take it all on. Our yeah, to be strong. Yeah, to be, to be strong, to be forced to be strong because there's no other outlet. Um, and it seems as if strong now becomes a bad word uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, no, you're actually super strong and resilient and powerful in all of the things. Like, yeah, but it doesn't have to be waved as a flag of, oh, I'm good, you know? Um, but then again, when it comes to men, um, recognizing that, hey, that this has been something that's been opened up for Black men. Like, Black men actually should be going to therapy, could yeah. be going to therapy, could be crying, should be crying at some point in time and expressing themselves and engaging in relationship in such a manner. 
Um, so I just wanted to know if there's any gender specificity around therapy. Well, when I was am seeing more men seeking therapy. Wait, but can you repeat the beginning what you said? I didn't that, we didn't hear um that I am seeing more men seeking um, therapy just by I don't work with men I only work with women who struggle with um, anxiety but their partners spouses are like looking for therapists right whereas wow. before we're not really here we, we don't really hear much about men seeking therapy and I think there's still needs a, there, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done because there's still that stigma attached to men expressing their emotions or sharing you know, how they're feeling about life, about marriage, about, you know, the church. Uh, yeah. There's so many different layers and variables here that they need to talk yeah. about, but maybe they refuse to because they've been taught differently, right? It's like, oh, yeah. if you express yeah. your emotions, oh, if you tell people, you know, that you're sensitive or that you're feeling sad about something that shows that you're a weak man or that, you know, you can't handle the household if you're talking about, that you're you're sad or you know affected by something. So mm -hmm. it, it needs to become the norm where men can express their emotions. And where does that mm -hmm. start, right? I guess it starts in the household. It starts with um, teachers. It starts with you know spouses saying to their their partners um, that it's okay. Yet you can share how you're feeling, you know. And it also takes vulnerability. Like men need to be also just more vulnerable in general. Um, with the people in their lives. And I think that's a struggle too um, yeah, for yeah. them to do yeah. that, is to be vulnerable. And it makes sense. You absolutely. Know, that, comes with, that comes with history. Yeah, absolutely. It's, even I was taught, you know, not to cry. Like, oh, I don't know what that is. Can you hear me properly? You kind of broke up your ear. I think it's... That's so weird. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Do you hear that in the background? Yeah, we heard it. So weird. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Um, but what I was saying was um, even I, as a woman, was told not to cry. And so to me, that was uh, that taught me that crying or crying too much or being a crybaby was weakness. <laughs> And I had to, you know, learn not to cry. And now that I'm older and I'm more aware, I'm like, that's not, there's nothing wrong with crying. Actually, sorry, there's a lot going on over here. <laughs> um, stop. My goodness, so sorry. Um, but, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with crying. I'm going to just beat myself. Go ahead. So one of the things that, I mean, as, as a woman specifically, I, I, when, as Janelle was talking about crying, I think we have been oftentimes socialized as as like not to cry, right? Because that is seen as a form of weakness. And one of the things that we have, and I, I've seen this time and time again, and I know you probably have as well, Trishna, that there's such a conversation about masculine energy women and <laughs> feminine energy women. And I think um, a lot of times we have to, we're not considering how we are being socialized um, as women. And one thing, I, I mean, for myself, <clears throat> I've always loved um, the idea of having like uh, the, the, the conversation around what, what is it that you were taught about womanhood? And I think that people never really have those types of conversations, but you'll learn what not to do as a woman. And if you are told what not to do as a woman, something specific around, let's say, for example, don't cry. Oh, I think we lost Trishna for a moment. Did we lose you? Do you hear us? Trishna, do you hear us? I haven't been able to hear you. Now I do. Okay. Speak. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. So what we were asking um, and talking about was just the, the, the socialization of women and just not being able to, to openly cry um, and to openly express themselves because it is seen as a, as a weakness when we have consistently talked about this like masculine energy woman or 
this feminine energy woman and how the feminine energy woman is more appealing than the masculine energy woman, but we're mm. not talking about where that even comes from and why does she have any level of masculine energy because that has been socialized within her and then also perpetuated throughout her life, right? Um, so I think the question um, specifically around that is like when you are facing the depression, the seasonal depression, how exactly, how exactly do you even start the process of speaking out when you have been told that speaking out is not it? That's not what you do. It's maybe considered weak, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's considered weak. Especially culturally as black women, black men, like that's like, or even Caribbean, if, wherever you're from. But it's like, that is normally seen as some, something for the crazy people. Um, as opposed to, hey, I need someone to talk to. There's nothing wrong with us having a conversation. And that doesn't mean that you are less of, that you less, that you love Jesus any less because of the fact that you are in therapy. So if you can talk a little bit about that, please. Sure. So I think it starts off with the person feeling safe, knowing that they're safe expressing how they're feeling. And that can take some time if they've been taught the opposite, right? If, you know, you've been told all this time that you shouldn't be expressing yourself or there's something wrong, you know, with you if you are talking about your depression or not feeling well or feeling low, it's gonna take some time for you to feel comfortable with doing the opposite, meaning it actually expressing yourself and trying to seek help, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's gonna take some time and that may take a friend or family member noticing that, okay, I'm, you know, I'm seeing that you haven't been doing well mentally and emotionally. You wanna talk about that? Because it may not be that actual person who will come out to say it because they're so used to keeping it in within yeah so yeah. it may take another party actually noticing or observing hey i noticed you aren't yourself you don't want to talk about it and you know we can only hope that that person will feel safe and comfortable with expressing themselves because that is mm -hmm. that is imperative like to be in a safe space and know that it's okay for you to talk about your feelings if that person isn't feeling safe then they may not open up and we can only hope that they are in an environment where they feel comfortable with opening up. But that can take some time based on what they've been told and what they've been experiencing for so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you were talking earlier about the program that you um, have been developing. What exactly does that look like in creating safe spaces in the workplace? Like, is there, and I, I know this question might sound crazy, but you already know so many people have all the things to think about, but is there like a particular room? Is there like a, a mat? Like, what does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, and I know that um, the university that I that I teach at specifically has a room. Um, oh, they just wonderful. developed a a room, a sensory room, is what it called what it's called with bean bags and like. Um, lights and like you can touch things and it, it can be like a, a decompressing space for students. So what does that look like when you're talking about giving that space? So when I say creating a safe space for me um, or for the release program, that basically means a space where a person will feel comfortable with expressing their emotions, where, where there will be no judgment, where, um, uh, the higher ups, whether it be the VP, the supervisor will not um, take that information and use it against them. Is the so, supervisor in the room? No, the supervisor okay. is in the room. And it all, it, it depends, right? So the release program can provide safe spaces for staff. They can provide safe spaces for the supervisors, but they're never intertwined. They're never together because we want, let's okay. just say all the supervisors to feel equal, right? So it's not yeah. like um, the VP and then the supervisor and then the VP feels a certain way about what the supervisor is expressing. The whole yeah, point is right. to make sure that they can talk about their experiences in the workplace and how it's affecting them physically, mentally, 
and or emotionally so that there can be an intervention that can be brought to the higher ups about it to see what can be done. So is this similar to like employee relations? Because isn't that similar in the, in the, um, in the workspace around like, okay, you, you need someone to, and they normally work within HR, I believe, but um, that you need someone to express yourself to and right. they close the door, they listen to you and then ask you what you want to do as follow-up and then go from there if you want them. Cause I, I, I feel like I've had that experience with the super, with the, someone before. And I think that that person, I believe, yeah, he, he was in employee relations. Mm. So we believe that, you know, it's in, important to embed like mental wellness programs within different systems and that would include different you know clinicians as opposed to maybe hr reps who may not Got have it. like clinical background to Got really it. help you, under, you yeah. know help yeah. The, yeah. the individual understand like why they're feeling what they're feeling and what it's connected to where maybe the hr rep or the employee re relations um staff member is there is listening and may have maybe some tools or, or strategies to help the person. But our goal is to like really help the individually, like holistically, right? Like mm -hmm. really understand mm -hmm. like what's mm -hmm. going on emotionally, mentally, mm -hmm. physically, mm -hmm. where it's so mm -hmm. hard for them to thrive in the workplace mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. at school. I love that. I love that. Someone said, Timothy said, no safe space at work environment. So for him, there hasn't been any safe spaces for him at work. And I'm so glad that you are bringing that to your to wherever you're working, um, wherever you're hired, I guess. And it needs to be more, you know, because some people are dying on the inside at work, yeah. especially at work. Yeah. No oh, one yeah. to talk to. Oh, no yeah. one to talk to. So I have a question moving forward with the word loneliness and that state, you know, like. I've heard that word so many times um, and especially around people who actually have family members and friends around them. So mm. what do you say for, to, to one of your clients that says they are lonely? Sorry, my daughter wants to be involved in this conversation. <laughs> this is, listen, this is life with Trey and Jane. This is Jay's life. And it's right. my life. Yeah. Yep. Normally yep. my husband will be here, but he's not for a really good reason. But, you know, so anyway, what would you say to your client that is having like, not, not, she's not, he or she is not only lonely for one time, but like she, he or she is lonely consistently. Has so, been experienced a pattern of loneliness. So maybe we would talk a little bit about, you know, when the loneliness began, um, if she has noticed, you know, who she becomes lonely with or what causes the loneliness. Like, so for example, a person may um, always feel lonely when it comes around, um, friendships right for some reason she feels isolated or she feels left out um and because of that she feels lonely and then there may be some individuals who feel lonely when it comes to companionship like i'm noticing that relationships never work for me and because of that i'm experiencing loneliness when it comes to you know not finding a partner right so there could be different levels of loneliness or just feeling loneliness in general like i'm feeling alone i don't i don't have any friends um i haven't been able to to meet with someone um and when that comes up it's like well once again i always go back to like how can you take care of yourself when you are experiencing loneliness right because it goes back to like how can we nurture love provide that compassion that we need um, to ourselves when we're not getting it from others, right? So when we when we feel that there should be a need for others to give us what we need, then it's going to affect us mentally and emotionally. So it's like learning and training ourselves, like how can we give that love to ourselves, right? And there's nothing wrong, and I want to make sure I say there's nothing wrong with wanting a companion, right? Or wanting to feel yeah, connected yeah, or loved yeah, yeah, yeah. by others. We're called to like do life with others and you know, feel love. There's nothing wrong with that. But then how do we also love ourselves? Sometimes we're used to maybe being attached to other people where it's so hard for us to be by ourselves and to yeah. learn more about ourselves. So in our loneliness, 
how can we learn about ourselves? How can we provide that love, care, and compassion that we need to ourselves when we feel like there's no one else around, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like pouring into yourself, pouring, pouring. What are the different, how, are, how can you pour into yourself on a daily basis? So how do you ride that fine line of not getting into like retail, like, you know, buying something that's too expensive for yourself or paying for something that's too expensive, that's out of your budget? Like how, how do you get, how do you transition loneliness in terms of pouring into yourself and it not being pouring into yourself to a detriment, so to speak. Mm, Right. So it's knowing, right. What, what you may be prone to do. Some people, when they're feeling lonely, they do excessive like shopping, right. Or they may find themselves, um, you know, maybe eating. Yeah, eating, right? Eating could be um, a different thing too, which is also part of like seasonal depression. Um, people have the tendency of eating more um, when you know they're affected by less sunlight. So whether it be eating, shopping, anything excessive, it's you noticing, right? It's like, oh, I, I notice that or become aware, self-awareness. I notice that when I'm feeling lonely, I have the tendency of shopping or, you know, um, have like binge eating. It's like really knowing who you are. And sometimes once again, it's you talking through that with someone. Sometimes we're not even aware, like we're just eating nonstop or we're like doing some excessive shopping and we're like, oh, we're just treating ourselves. You know, it's making me feel good. And then, you know, of course I will say there's nothing wrong with treating yourself to something once in a while, maybe having a treat, you know, but if you feel that it's becoming to the point where it's uh, an addiction where you're like, this is the only way that I can survive or feel good is if I have this thing, then it's like, well, how do I work through that? How do I not make this thing um, a priority or put it on a pedestal because that's how Mm -hmm. I'm surviving or thriving. Mm -hmm. So it's self-awareness, like really being aware of like what's happening to you and like what's triggering that, right? It's like, oh, I feel lonely. So now I'm going to do this. So it's like, okay, being aware of that, acknowledging that and figuring out other ways to help you cope with the loneliness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely, because I remember, like, I would say for myself and for a lot of people I know, they they would feel lonely and somehow get attention from. For me, it, it was guys, you know. So, like, if I was lonely or if I felt like rejected by a guy, I would somehow found find attention from some other guy. And I realized, like, wait, this yeah. is unhealthy because it's 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 like eating McDonald's. Like, it's 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 very it's not fulfilling. Um, and this is not going to lead to a healthy relationship, you know, but thanks well, sustainable, right. It was definitely unsustainable. And so, you know, thankfully I was self-aware. I became self-aware. Like you said, several times you have to be self-aware. You have to know what you, who you she's saying the same thing, you know, like what we are, you know, who you are and what your, uh, what does, uh, what's your triggers. So yeah. I have a question as far as like Jesus is concerned, right? Um, how did, what is, as a believer and a therapist, uh, what is your, um, advice on how to incorporate your faith into loneliness, depression, or anything that you may be going through mentally, emotionally? So with, um, because not all of my clients are believers, but I have the tendency, um, of just reminding all of my clients, whether they're a believer or not, that despite what you're experiencing, loneliness, depression, know that you were created to be worthy, right? And they can take that, run with it or not. But knowing that you were created to be worthy, knowing that you were created to be loved, you know, to hold on to that, right? Hold on to the fact that, you know, you weren't created to just be here by yourself, right? That you can actually find comfort and peace knowing that you were created to be loved, to be, to be seen, um, to be, to belong, to, to matter, to be enough. Right. So I definitely highlight and specify that a lot, you know, with my clients that especially those who do struggle with loneliness and even anxiety, because that's the bulk of my clients, you know, when they're facing loneliness or anxiety or experiencing it, they usually feel like they don't belong or they don't matter or they're not enough. So, you know, I always remind them that 
no, you do actually matter. You are enough because you're here. You were created. You were brought here for a reason and you weren't brought here to not matter or to not be enough or to not belong. You know, so how can you genuinely believe that? So that's the next step. And that's the the the, the other part of the work that we need to do together, because I can simply say to Janelle, to Tracy, like, of course you're enough. Of, of course you matter. Of course you belong. But you may not genuinely believe that for yourself. Mm-hmm. So then it's like mm-hmm. understanding, well, why don't you believe that? And seeing yeah. what that's connected and rooted into. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's where the work begins. Because right. there's, there's so many things that, that our childhood, my goodness. And I'm trying to be very careful with my daughter as to, you know, say say the right things or just, you know, just incorporate um, affirmations and just be very aware as to what is said to her and what she's exposed to, because it really, truly is something that forms um, beliefs in us as we grow older. I mean, I think that happens when we're older too, but it mainly happens when we're kids. Right. Um, so yeah. Right. And it may not even be someone actually verbally saying to you, Janelle, you don't matter. Tracy, you're not enough. It could just be by what you've seen, what you've experienced, mm-hmm. where you then interpret it as, oh, I guess if mom isn't there or if mom feels like this isn't important or dad doesn't feel like it's an important, maybe then I don't matter. You interpreted their actions as not mattering. And then it's like mm-hmm. this negative core belief then traveled with you up until adulthood. And now it's like you telling yourself the truth. It's like you believe false things about yourself. And now it's like, well, how do I, you know, remind myself of who I actually am, the truth about myself. Uh, and it's the core belief. That's the part. That you mentioned, right. yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Trishna. Um, as my daughter sings the ABCs, um, what do you have to say? You kind of you mentioned this already, but um, what do you have to say now in the holiday season for those who are uh, dealing with depression and uh, loneliness, maybe even suicidal thoughts? Um, when it comes to the holidays and losing so many loved ones through COVID and God forbid, all the other things that can happen in life? Um, a couple of things. One thing is I, I um, am passionate. Um, I desire and I long for myself and for people to experience community. I don't think we were called to like do life alone. So during the holiday season when you're feeling alone or depressed really trying to see how you can tap into community um if you don't have that you know because i know there there are people who don't have loved ones that they can go to or a friend that they can speak with like Mm -hmm. figure out other ways online you know starting from somewhere seeing how you can create that that community changing the narrative for yourself and seeing how that can look like for you and then also how can you be, you know, very kind, gentle, patient with yourself during the holiday season? You know, being okay with saying no when you need to say no, being okay with setting boundaries when you need to set boundaries, you know, being okay, you know, if, you know, you're not in a relationship and all your cousins and aunts are, you know, asking you why aren't you? It's like, you know, being okay with where you are and not, you know, punishing yourself for not being where others may want you to be mm, mm, mm. not punishing yourself for where others may want you to be or even where you may want to be right yes yeah we, we yeah. are our, our deepest uh we, we are our critics we our inner critics could be very yeah. very loud so maybe it's even quiet down ourselves like okay listen like i'm not gonna let you take over my mind and my body right now i'm i'm gonna be okay yeah 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 yeah, thank you, Trishna. I mean, is there anything that you um, want to make sure that we imp- that you impart in um, on on our audience? Well, I know that there are a lot of women, Black women, who may need mental health services and cannot afford it. So I just wanted to share that there are several organizations out there that do provide scholarships to those who need um, therapy. There's therapy for black girls and black girls smile. 
Those are two organizations that actually provide scholarships to women of color who cannot afford therapy and on top of additional mental health resources. I provide workshops with Black Girls Smile. So if you are just looking for community, maybe you don't want to start therapy yet and that's okay. But maybe you just want to be with another group of women talking about your anxiety, wanting to learn different coping mechanisms. There are organizations out there where you can tap into that community. So Black Girls Smile, Therapy for Black Girls, they are providing resources out there to young Black women who may need mental health resources. Is it Black Girls Smile or Black Girls Smile? No, it's Black Girls Smile. I just looked yes. it up. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's Black Girls Smile. So two S's, y'all. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate this. I'm going to share this information with others. Um, yeah. And tell us about your organization and um, again, and how we can get in touch with you. Yes. Yes. So um, the release program, you can find that information on my website, which is trishnalmsw.com. We are currently um, working with schools, small companies, um, nonprofit organizations who are looking to create these safe spaces for their staff, for their students, so that they can feel good holistically. So if you know of anyone who would like to um, implement these spaces at work, at school, we are here to, to help you and to support you. Good, good job. Thank you so much. That's good. You're welcome. You're this welcome. is good. Y'all, toast to Trishna, okay? T toast. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, so much for having me. This was great. A little nerve-wracking, but great. <laughs> no, you gave us all the info. You really did. I mean, this is this has been so informative because, at, I mean, we say it all the time, but on this channel, we share our lives to empower others to love Jesus, love themselves and love others well. And in order to truly be able to love yourself and to love others well, you there has to be a, a um, there has to be you loving Jesus that like it, there's an order for a particular reason. Even if people are not believers, um, we still say it, but it's the fact that uh, we want to make sure that when we're talking about certain topics, that it falls in line with one of those three areas. Um, and so thank you so much for showing us time and time again in all the things that you were saying as to how to make sure that we are showing kindness to ourselves, loving ourselves, acknowledging ourselves, being um being real with ourselves. What are your triggers? Getting to know yourself um, so that we aren't just spewing whatever types of relationship we can with others or doing, you know, doing things haphazardly, but really taking time for ourselves um, and learning to love ourselves um, and how to be kind. That, that right there is a huge, um, huge, huge, huge thing that you were saying. Hey, Amani. Hi. She said hi. 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 So, so that being said, I'm going to mute myself and um, yeah. Thank you ladies yes. so, so much for having me tonight. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, as you already know, when you log onto this channel, we are talking about sharing our lives to empower others to love Jesus, love themselves, and love others well. Thank you so much, Trishna, for joining us on tonight. Um, shout out to you for liking, commenting, subscribing, because clearly you already have done all of the things. Um, and make sure you are following us on Instagram at Life with Trey and J, spelled exactly how you pulled up on here, T-R-A-Y-A-N-D-J-E-A. -A -A. Um, I also wanted to make sure, Trishna, that you let us know where to find you. Did you did you say that? Yes, um, on Instagram, Trish LMSW, or my website, TrishnaLMSW.com. All right. Thank you, y'all. Have a good night, good morning, good afternoon, whichever time you're watching this. Bye, y'all.
Good night. <laughs>